uh, we're a small group and, and everybody can just pitch in, but just since we're, since we're larger than just a few, this is Ann Gothier, and, and let me welcome everybody to today's call. We will have an opportunity to um, go around the virtual room, and uh, we're, we're expecting eight of our 13 grant T states to participate um, in this call today. This is our peer learning group on enrollment and retention. It's actually our fourth SHAP peer learning group meeting. Um, and at the end of this, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to be changing the format going forward um, next year. Um, you guys know that we really hope that this is an opportunity to share information and ideas with each other, and that this is not, um, as opposed to if you were on our, our last national webinar that was also sponsored by the SHAP program, this is not a national webinar. This is a peer learning group call just for grantees only. But you heard all that technology at the beginning because we are recording it, and uh, we really do want to encourage you to share it with your colleagues um, subsequent to the call here. So um, again, I just want to offer the opportunity that if anybody has a problem with speaking on this call because it's being recorded and that's impeding your frank conversation, we really hope that you will let us know um, and we'll, we'll figure out a better way to um, share when we're not in person. So, I, uh, just a few more comments of, of introduction so that, and before we go around the room. What we're going to do today is we're going to spend the first chunk of time, um, about 25 minutes, hearing from each of, um, of, of the SHAC states. So um, we're going to ask you uh, about any recent developments in, their, in your programs related to enrollment and retention. Uh, we'll then hear from Maureen Hensley Quinn, who is a policy specialist here at Nashby, and she's the deputy director director of the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation program, Max Enroll. Uh, it was formerly known as Maximizing Enrollment for Kids. Max Enroll is now broadening its scope to other populations in addition to children. So Maureen um, is going to provide you guys with a, um, a treat, a, a personal overview of the recently released interactive web-based toolkit that um, Nashby um, developed. And it's, it's designed to help states identify strengths and weaknesses in their current systems to enroll and retain children in Medicaid and CHIP and to highlight op improvement opportunities. We thought that even though a number of you are focusing on adult populations, there are just so many translatable lessons. And uh, I know that Max and Roll will be broadening this in the future to include other populations. And some of you asked, um, is, is this appropriate for us? And we think it's very much appropriate um, as you're all thinking about enrollment and retention. So after um, Maureen's presentation, we'll um, ask specifically New York and, um, and Virginia to share their thoughts and experiences on the tool because they, have, um, they are actually max and roll states and we'll have time for some other questions. So um, I have a feeling that you all do know the ReadyTalk platform that we have used numerous times. Um, I really think that here we have the opportunity to actually talk with each other using the phone. I'm hoping that you're all logged in both on the phone end um, and on the web-based um, link that was sent out with the agenda on Friday. But um, we do want to encourage you that if you have any question, um, if you have any question that while somebody else is speaking, whether it's one of your peer states or whether it's our, our guest speaker, Maureen, or one of our reactor states, please um, type in the chat box because uh, then, then Chris and I, who are sitting in our DC office, Kathy Whitgert on our team is, um, is, is, in, is in her Boston office at the time, and, and Christina Miller is, um, is unfortunately homesick today, but I assume she's plugging in from there. In any case, Chris and I can see it, and then we can make sure that Maureen or Steve or Ann Volpel can um, respond to your question. So with that, let me actually um, walk us around the virtual room uh, based upon the states that we're aware of here. 
sometimes I try to get clever and try to go in reverse alphabetical order, et cetera, but um, I'm not quite organized to do that this way. So I'm going to actually go in, in state alphabetical order. I'm going to save, um, going to let, let states, uh, New York and, and Virginia say hello that you're here, but we're going to wait for your updates um, until you speak later. So with that, um, let me also first see, do we have Shadak and Hersa also on the phone? Yes, this is Elizabeth from Shadak. Great. And do we have either Fred or Michelle on? Not yet. The benefits of recording. If they're busy with something else, they'll be able to listen, and they definitely do, by the way. Um, so, so why don't we go with no... Um, with no further ado, to uh, Colorado. I think we have Megan on from Colorado. Um, yes, this is Megan Wood from Colorado. Um, I, um, I chatted with Kathy um, Whitgert earlier this week, and she encouraged us to give just a brief update on uh, a project that we're doing that's not necessarily tied to our SHAP grant, but um, the Colorado Health Foundation is spearheading it, and we are part of the advisory committee, and they are doing an um, a role enrollment strategic assessment on our current situation and how um, we are going to tie into the Affordable Care Act. And their, um, the, the, the assessment that they're doing will be delivered to um, the new governor and will be open for public viewing in mid-January. So that will, um, it's assessing our current CBMS situation and our MMIS situation and um, recognizing that we're, we're really constrained now and that we are going to have a bunch more eligible folks that will be um, drugged through, through, the, through the enrollment system and eligibility system and how we're going to be able to handle that. And they're giving us some options and recommendations on, on where, what, um, what we can do to make us a more robust system and state to um, sync up with the Affordable Care Act. So, so that sounds um, like a terrific resource. Um, one of the things that, that we will want to do, if it's okay, it sounds like it will be available to the public. We, could we ask you to, um, to share this through our listserv with your, with your SHAP peers when it's available? Or, or actually, you can yeah. also get you know, to Kathy and, and she'll make sure, we will make sure that that happens? Yes, definitely. Great. Um, okay, I just moved my list away from me. Thanks so much, Megan. You're welcome. Um, I think we do not have Kansas on the phone, although you're part of this group, but let me just make sure that nobody from Kansas is here. So let's move back across to the really cold part of the country. Um, Maine. I think we have... Gloria on the phone? Yes, I'm here. I, and it is very cold <laughs> and snow on the ground. Goodness. <laughs> but hey, you know, it's beautiful, I guess. <laughs> um, yes, I wanted to talk about our part-time worker voucher program that um, we've spoken of before. But a couple of new things. One is we've done a postcard mailing to employers of under 50 employees. And we sent out around five, a little over 5,000 of the postcards. And um, with this postcard, we decided not to have a return portion, uh, but to encourage them to call us directly instead so that we kind of get more automatic feedback. And also because employers, um, so many of them have a January um, anniversary date for their employers coverage for their employees. Uh, we wanted to um, you know, get that turnaround time in a more quick fashion. Um, and I'm thinking maybe you all would, might want to see the postcard. I know there was interest in the past with a previous postcard. So if it's okay, I could send that for the listserv so you all can see it. I'm I'm sure that we would that, that everyone would like to see it. Is that something that can be scanned in and sent electronically? Yes. 
Awesome. I will do that after the caller or tomorrow, probably more likely. Um, we don't know the um, response yet because it was just mailed a couple of days ago, but we're very hopeful. And uh, we're going to watch the obviously the um, return rate on this. And then we're poised to send another 5,000 or possibly a bit more um, out to 5,000 more employers. This time we targeted certain types of employers where we've been getting more um, reaction from for the voucher program for their part-time and seasonal workers. Um, for instance, restaurants and direct care workers, uh, that kind of um, and attorneys and some various ones that we've um, been getting some impact from. Um, so I'll give you an update on that um, whenever it's appropriate at our, at our next call or at our meeting in January. We also are running three radio spots and we're getting extremely good reaction from them. Um, and they feature a couple of our voucher program employers that have certified and come on board for their employees and uh, their employees, a couple of their employees, and an insurance broker who brought business to the um, voucher program. And um, it, once again, a little too soon to know the um, output we're going to get from those, but the reaction to them is extremely good. I happened in my private life to go to one of the restaurants and actually the server was one that was a featured person um, and she was telling me how many people have mentioned uh, that this restaurant and how they're giving uh, the coverage to their employees and it's impressed them as, as individuals. Um, so wow. yeah, that's exciting for them of course and of course um, it kind of is a little perk for the employee to hear. People realize that it's her from her voice. Um, and I can also send those so that you can click on. Um, I can send them electronically. There are three different radio spots. And um, you could also listen to them in case you could glean something, um, even though your opportunity isn't exactly like ours or even very much like ours. Um, as grantees, but it might spur something <coughs> in your thinking or for some other avenue in your business. So I can also do that as well. Well, uh, it, it wouldn't be fair of me to speak for the grantees except that I'll do it anyway because in our experience, um, you know, things like that really are so enormously useful even if it, as you said, Gloria, even if it isn't um, exactly like the circumstance, just seeing how some, somebody else has approached that gives, will give an idea when um, the time comes in another state. That's kind of, I, I know that's, that, that's kind of peer-to-peer, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, or 101, I should say, but um, it really works. So uh, it's so nice to be able to share things electronically now like that. That's really great. So thank you. Yeah, and any reactions you might have, uh, feel free to email me or call or whatever if, if something strikes you. Either way, but I think you're going to find them to be uh, very well done and easy to listen to. Great. I, um, I think that's it for right now for kind of anything in the newness realm. Well, thanks very much, Gloria. Let's um, move. We're going to stay in the cold realm in my alphabetical order from Maine to Minnesota um, that also has seen that white stuff um, recently. At least it's at least it's reported. Um, is that Allison that we have here from Minnesota? Um, Allison's here. This is Kara. Oh, hi, Kara. Uh, you spoke up hi. first. Sorry, too. Great. No problem. Uh, yeah, it's a little cold here. <laughs> um, we don't really have anything terribly exciting and new to report, um, but we, we, we are steady and strong on the local access to care programs that are um, up and running, health share, our small multi-share in the northern, northeastern part of the state um, has achieved enrollment of 248. And so, so far it's about 15 people over its, its goal for the year. 
Um, Portico, our larger uh, local access to care program that enrolls people individually as opposed to going through their employer. Their SHAP related enrollment is at 650, um, which is 16 over their year to date goal at this point. And we are really pleased to report that Values Health, um, which is located kind of in the central portion, central and western portions of the state, is um, currently marketing and has spoken to and is under contract negotiation with 13 employers. Um, those average about five people per employer. So um, we're hoping that uh, this month they will, um, they have a goal of meet of having 100 employees by January 14th. So we are hopeful that they will not only meet that but exceed that by January. So they are underway. And so that brings our total enrollment at this point, and I believe this, this was as of the November report, so this would be as of October 31st, um, brings our total enrollment to 898 people through SHAP. Great. Is there anything in your state um, in terms of, are there discussions about, um, about preparing for um, enrollment um, when health reform phases in that you want to, uh, to raise here or put on the table? And you don't have to, by the way. Um, but I wanted to just give you that opportunity and we can maybe weave, that, weave things into the discussion. Um, at this point in time, I mean, we are looking at the role of local access to care programs, uh, given a, a number of possible scenarios for the distribution of the uninsured throughout the state. Um, and then, of course, the other part of our grant does deal with um, improvements in our um, Medicaid and public program online application and electronic verification systems. So we are moving forward with those. And um, at this point in time, those are all under development. And those testing is planned for February for both of those systems in some way. So, um, so those are moving forward. But we're not yet enrolling people electronically. Gotcha. OK. Um, I think that um, we had North Carolina on this. Uh, but I don't think we have a North Carolina person here today. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, so we'll move to possibly a warmer place at this point. Um, we have Nevada, and I think we have Laura on the phone here. And we're talking about updates on anything regarding um, enrollment, retention, um, or, or anything else about health reform or anything you'd like to share. Laura? Yes, hi Ann, this is Laura. Uh, it is uh, probably warmer here in northern Nevada than uh, Minnesota or Maine, um, although we're supposed to get up to the 50s today. Um, for enrollment and retention, we have our report from uh, the month of October, which showed us with a statewide enrollment of 268. Uh, we have expanded uh, to our subgrantee access to healthcare network uh, to a statewide program, and uh, that is getting up to speed in Southern Nevada. She's basically setting up her network of providers down there and working with the county to uh, bring on uh, some of their folks that were previously covered under the county and may be able to shift onto her program. So we're expecting that the numbers are going to increase fairly dramatically in the next quarter uh, in Southern Nevada. And um, as far as retention goes, we have only had uh, one person disenroll. Um, some of the members go off uh, when they turn 65 because they get onto Medicare. But for other members, uh, basically they can stay on the program unless they don't comply with some of the requirements like getting all their screening done, uh, for example. And that was the case with the one person who was disenrolled uh, in November. Um, they, they basically had not followed through. And what we're finding is a lot of people are kind of squeamish about the, the requirement to get uh, colon cancer screening with a colonoscopy. And so uh, I was just speaking with uh, Sherry Rice, the director for that, that program, 
and she has talked with um, a physician who indicated they might do some other testing um, that could be an alternative to a colonoscopy. So she is going to offer that to her members who uh, have not been interested in doing the colonoscopy, and uh, hopefully that will resolve that issue. Um, it's a small program when we know about the one person, but I know <laughs> I'm reminding everyone um, that Nevada's um, program is targeted towards 60 to, to 64 year olds, hence um, a very different population than, than those who are working with an employed population or those who are working with a, um, a, a more typical low income uh, Medicaid type population and the, the churning issues are very, I, I suspect, very different there. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, we, we did just expand, actually, to 55 to 64-year-olds this year um, and, uh, you know, are, are getting some additional people on because of that uh, expanded age group. I, I think the fact that I uh, made all the other site visits except for yours personally um, made that fact not stick in my head. So I'm uh, hope to come um, this year when we come. Great. So okay. thank you. You're welcome. Um, and and um, we are skipping New York for now. But if you just want to say hello, New York is here. Yes, we're here. They're on, they're on mute, so I didn't mean to I didn't mean to throw that at you. Um, okay. And we can't alphabetize. I said North Carolina before Nevada, um, so it, it shows there's always room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move next to Oregon. Um, who's here from Oregon? Steve Novick is here. We might have others as well. Hi, Steve. How are you? All right. So update, updates on or, from Oregon. I had well, the, we can uh, the, the pleasure I will say of spending some time with some of your colleagues um, in Denver at the end of last week, and a good deal of uh, a good deal of thinking about exchanges happened. I was just hearing that from Tina, yeah, and it sounded like we were hearing good things from the feds. So we can report that our Healthy Kids program has now enrolled about 70,000 kids, uh, which we're very pleased with. Uh, we just revamped our application um, with some help from the Center for Health Literacy, uh, help which was paid for with CHAP funds, which we appreciate. Uh, we hope the application will be easier to understand, and also we have reduced the amount of documentation that we are requiring from people. We're going from asking for up to two months' worth of pay stubs to prove how poor people are to one representative pay stub, which is what New Jersey does, which we think will dramatically reduce the rate of pended cases and uh, but reduce workload for both clients and caseworkers. Uh, we just had a meeting with our upper management on whether we should adopt some of the retention policies that Louisiana has adopted. For example, one of their major innovations is administrative renewal for people who, when they applied, were below 75% of the income threshold for the program in which they were enrolled. And that has dramatically reduced the amount of work that they do on uh, renewal, and it's also uh, dramatically reduced their churn rate. And our top management agreed that's something worth looking into. We want to do some additional research to make sure that that's not going to have, you know, result in an increased error rate, and also try to figure out the potential budget impacts. But it's definitely something we're interested in. So well, those are some of the things we're doing. That's 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 terrific. Um, uh, you know, I, I know that Louisiana is a model on on retention. I'm, I'm to be honest, um, and and I the people in Louisiana are really working hard, and they have been uh, well, they always have been, but you know, th there's really been quite a rebuilding since um, Katrina. But it's really cool to see them being a model in this area. I think so. Uh, Oregon. Um, is picking picking up something from the from the deep south, which is is really very interesting. I um, 
I wish, when we cut to the grantee meeting, who's ever there, I'll, I'll show you the visual that I learned from, from the folks in Oregon, which is the, the dual um, come on in and no, we don't want you, um, traditional, it's, so I can do that in a visual way, but it's, it's the traditional mindset of enrollment um, and not even so much thinking about retention. And I really think that, that this is starting to change as we move towards 2014. So that's pretty cool. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, now, Steve Horan, um, you are on the line, I see, which is wonderful. You want to say hi, but then we'll let you speak um, as a max enroll state as well after Maureen gives her presentation. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, do we have, and I think the only remaining state on here that, that hasn't spoken yet is, um, is Washington State. I see Randy has signed in. Yes, I'm listening in. So um, the update from Washington is we're, we're very excited that we are ready for our coverage to begin January 1st. Um, the brokers have been working hard on uh, bringing those applications in. We've noticed an increased call level from the brokers on questions, ensuring that they are getting folks uh, signed up uh, using the forms correctly. So we're excited about that. Terrific. And, and Beth, um, are, you, are you finished the meeting that happened today? Uh, no, Beth is uh, off doing that. So I'm listening in today on her behalf. Great. Well, we, we, we corresponded through the night. So hopefully, um, hopefully all's going well there. Yeah, she very much appreciated you uh, sending her uh, some more information. Uh, she shared this morning that she had received some more information from you, so that was very helpful. She was very excited. Good. So thank you. Well, great. So, um, so thanks, everybody, for the updates, and we're right on schedule. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing today's guest speaker, my colleague, Maureen hensley Quinn. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, she's a policy specialist at Nashby and, importantly, um, is the deputy director, that's a new promotion, of Max and Roll, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation-funded project. Um, Max and Roll works with eight states to cover eligible but unenrolled children, and three of those states, New York, Virginia, and Wisconsin, are also SHAP participants. And we will get the pleasure of hearing from two of them today um, with their experience with this um, pretty interesting tool. So, so a little bit more about Maureen prior to joining Nashby in um, March of 2007. She's almost been here three years. She was the medical specialist in the Community Transportation Association of America. She received her bachelor's in political science from Merrimack College in Massachusetts and her master's in public affairs um, from the uh, John McCormick School of Public Policy at UMass in Boston. I received my master's from UMass in Amherst, cool. something that she and I have not shared no. until this <laughs> moment here. So um, Maureen, let me turn it over to you. And thanks so much. Maureen um, is, is deputy director, and they're doing our national grantee meeting starting uh, tomorrow. So we really appreciate her taking this time. Well, thank you so much. And really appreciate um, joining this call. And I was lucky enough to be here to listen to some of your updates. It's really cool to hear what you're all doing. Um, so I think we've gone over um, the Maximizing Enrollment for Kids program with um, the SHAP group before. So I'm going to run through my um, introductory slides quickly, but just wanted to frame our tool. And in order to do that, it just it helps to understand um, where it started from. But so I'll give you a quick overview, and then we'll go on a little toolkit tour. Um, and then um, happy to take questions, but excited to hear that um, New York and Virginia are on the line as well. So very quickly, we can move to the next slide. Um, just as a reminder, maximizing enrollment for kids, which Anne did mention, we are going to be shifting to a broader scope. 
um, very soon, and we're announcing that at our grant team meeting this week, but we've been leaking the information as <laughs> we've gotten the opportunity to. Um, it is a $15 million Robert Wood Johnson um, Foundation initiative. And the goal of the program really is to move the needle on enrollment. And in doing so, in, in doing so document what works. Um, there is an ongoing evaluation piece um, that is tracking how states are doing with their enrollment. And we're uh, measuring those up against their policy improvements as we go along. Um, there are eight great grantee states. Um, and those states are um, on this map that you'll see in front of you. Um, and we began in February of 2009. We began the program with a diagnostic assessment of all eight states. Um, it really was um, an intensive effort that all eight grantee states um, were active and participated in throughout. It was about a nine-month process. We contracted with Health Management Associates to um, develop a diagnostic assessment protocol and conduct the assessments. The protocol is based on literature review and expert opinion. Um, it had multiple parts. We first collected a lot of background information from states. Then we asked the states to develop their own process maps of both enrollment and retention processes. Um, and for states that have separate CHIP programs, they had to develop um, both enrollment and retention for Medicaid and CHIP. And then um, we were part of a two-day site visit with um, HMA to talk with state officials directly and stakeholders in the state. Um, and then we were using that data, the data we collected and the data um, we collected during the site visits, to identify strengths, challenges, and opportunities within systems, um, policies, and processes um, to lay the foundation for the work that we've been doing with the grantees. Um, best way to describe what we learned from the diagnostic assessment sort of falls within these four key themes, um, process improvements and paperwork reduction. Um, the, the whole purpose is to make enrollment simpler for families and more efficient for the state. Um, it's so important to understand um, where each state is, and that helps you develop where your state needs to go by really digging into data and integrating that, not just on a quarterly basis or um, however often uh, we're learning a lot of states collect data, but really use that um, throughout the year and as you make changes to your program. Leadership is extremely important, as many of you know. Um, talking about, and leadership can fall within a, a broad scheme. It's not just um, the governor, but it's also your, your, in your agency, coordination with other agencies, and the culture within your state that goes all the way down to um, local offices. And then very importantly, um, consumer and community partners and um, how engaged stakeholders are, all very important. We built on our assessment findings to create um, improvement plans with each of the eight states. So last year, we brought them together for their first grantee meeting, and we dug into the reports that came um, as a result of the assessment, and we plotted out what their goals were going to be and their implementation strategies um, to target the um, areas in which the assessment identified um, could be improved upon. So they've been working on those goals since that time. And then States Next created yearly work plans. So they're in their second year. We're getting ready to uh, move into year three. The self-assessment toolkit expands the assessment opportunity to all states. Um, we announced the diagnostic assessment reports, and we um, talked about the interesting things that we were finding. And we heard a lot back from states saying, well, that's great, but what about my state? And is there any way that we could use some of what you've used for these eight states and make it more broad? And so we did that by pulling together this toolkit. Um, it has always been a goal of the Maximizing Enrollment Program to share lessons with all states, and we think that this is a really interesting and unique way to do that. We hope you do too. Um, I will just say that the diagnostic assessment protocol that the eight states 
went through really um, was the foundation for this toolkit. And so the pieces that I'm going to go through um, and tell you about really did come directly from the experience we had with the um, grantee states. And as we learned from them along the way, we hope that we've improved it so it works best for um, you all as well. So I'll give you a brief overview. The purpose of the toolkit is to help states understand enrollment and retention policies, procedures, and, and systems that you are currently using now and to help identify the barriers that some families face when applying um, or renewing for coverage. Now, as this program has been developed for, it really was focused on kids, and so we were looking mainly at Medicaid and CHIP programs. But as Anne said in the beginning, there are lots of lessons that can be pulled out from knowing what these two programs, how, um, how they work in these eight states and what they've been doing. Um, and one piece in particular comes to mind that I think all of you might benefit from um, doing, regardless of the populations that you're covering. Um, at the end of the, the toolkit, um, after you go through each piece, there will be an individualized um, report as well as other information that you can gather um, that really will help, um, help you understand where you are and perhaps where you need to go. The report provides best practices that are found in literature, supported by national experts, and used by other states. And I love this slide. It's an important safety tip. We really do recommend that you pull together teams to do this. Um, for our eight states, we encouraged them to um, have representation from Medicaid and CHIP program administration down to frontline eligibility workers, as well as um, pulling in external viewpoints, advocates, governor's office, um, folks from the legislature. It really is. Um, there's a lot of different pieces, and in order to get a full 360-degree view of what, where your state is and where it should go, you really need to have a team um, going at this at the same time. So there are four separate modules within the toolkit. The first is process mapping. The second is an interactive web-based questionnaire which will, at the end, um, generate for you an individualized report based on your answers. Um, we also include stakeholder questionnaires, and finally, an improvement plan meeting kit. So all of this mirrors the grantee experience, you'll see. Process mapping is something that I think every state could use for any um, population that they're covering. So what it really is, it, it's a it's a way to detail an application's trajectory from the applicant or family to the actual enrollment. And what we include sort of a, a how-to guide as well as um, an example of a completed process map online. Um, creating a process map can be an um, arduous task and you need a lot of people in the room to help you work through this. Um, a lot of what our states found was that even, even plotting out exactly the time period, so an application, whether it comes in through online, whether it comes in through a local office or through the mail, there's times that um, a lot of states have, have set and are within policy. You know, there's so many days it has to move from this to this. Coming together in one room to hear exactly how that works out, if it really does work as you think that it does or, if it, or where it can stumble and where things could take more time is extremely important in understanding how your systems are working currently. Um, we recommend that you determine the boundaries of the process mapping um, right up front. And what I mean by that is where does the process begin? Does it begin with the application coming in the mail? Does it begin with um, a person walking into a local office? Does it begin with an employer and, and writing out an application for coverage, where does it begin and then where does it end? At what point is an application um, finalized? If, it's, if it doesn't finalize with enrollment, at what point does um, the application, is it considered um, a, whether it's um, enrollment or whether it, there's a reason why it hasn't um, come to enrollment, what happens, where do you consider that to be an end point? You need to determine that before you start plotting it out for your process maps. 
And then the next slide it just is a picture that we actually got from the Southern Institute um, for Children and Families. They were, help, they were uh, working on a retention initiative. And they helped us a lot um, come up with our how-to guide. And this picture is from them when they went to a state and helped them plot out a, the retention processes. I believe it's for a, a CHIP program. Mm. So now, how does it actually work? Um, first of all, our toolkit does give you the how-to guide, as I said, and a sample process map. What you'll also find on there is a link to um, software that can help you create a process map electronically. I will say this software is a Microsoft software. It's called Visio. We, um, we are not definitely saying that you should buy it. It is for purchase, um, but it is also available for a trial download <laughs> for 60 days, and that's what most of our states did. They downloaded it for the 60-day trial period, used it to help plot out um, their processes. And I mean, some of our states have gone back and actually, it's, since it's been two years, they've redone their process map. So it may be worth the investment for the software, but we're just putting it up there so that you don't have to look around. Um, and then as I, as I mentioned, it really does need to be a team activity. And after it's all said and done and on this piece of paper, um, your team should review it together. The next um, piece of our toolkit is the interactive web-based questionnaire. The questionnaire is filled with specific questions that mirror our diagnostic assessment protocol. Um, it is intended also for a state team. There are questions that are divided between Medicaid and CHIP. Um, if in your case you're dealing only with adults that have no interaction with CHIP, then by all means skip. You don't have to answer those. You can just answer it for Medicaid. Or if this particular, if Medicaid and CHIP don't align well with what you're doing, even just reading through the questions to understand sort of where um, where we're going, what we're suggesting um, you look at and you think about, and what questions, um, particularly for data and how, what are you collecting, what should you collect, what do you know about your program, it really will help just reading through them. We got a lot of feedback from our states um, that even just getting the questions and then realizing that they couldn't answer them or that they could only answer half of the question was more helpful even than us getting the answer. And you'll see, um, I won't go through these in detail, but there are six target areas. Um, and I think there are many of these that, will, um, that relate a lot to what you're all doing as well. So I also included a couple of screenshots just so you get a sense of um, the toolkit and what we're talking about. So this page right here is where you'll go for um, just a brief introduction. And right down there at the bottom on the left, um, the Click Here button, there is a login that we're requiring states to use. And the reason we're requiring that is because we were told by um, the vendor who helped us um, pull all of this together that in order to have a start and stop function, then we needed to have a login. It, it's just a way to capture what you've been doing already save what you've done, and then you can go back and use it again. Um, and you don't lose all of the information that you've already put in there. And it is quite a long questionnaire, so it, it's helpful if you can stop and then start again. Here's um, a brief sample of what the questionnaire looks like. Um, this is just the beginning. And you'll see, like I said, it, there's a Medicaid and CHIP section. So, Teams also have to review the questionnaire ahead of time. We suggest assigning sections. We think it's very unlikely that one person can answer all the questions within the questionnaire. Um, as I mentioned, there is a start and stop function. Um, and you, in order to pass the, um, the uh, questionnaire along to the next person on your team, you will need to offer them your um, password and username so that they can get in there and not start from scratch. After the answers are all um, inputted, you will get a, a detailed report that is individualized based on um, your, your responses to the questions. The next module is our um, stakeholder questionnaires. And this is geared toward five audiences, which 
may work for some of you, but I believe there's probably um, audiences that we didn't include that um, would be helpful to um, what you're doing, like for instance, employers particularly. Um, but I, I still think it will give you a good sense of what you could be asking, what um, kind of feedback you want to be getting from um, the stakeholders that you're working with. And I just included a, a quick screenshot. This is a sample of a questionnaire um, for um, advocates and community-based organizations. Um, we suggest that you send them out, but if you, there's any way that you could have people send them back anonymously so that they're not necessarily identifying themselves, um, that would work out best. When we did this with our grantee states, we went out and in site visits had um, conversations with stakeholders where in some cases the state um, joined and in some cases they didn't. Um, next slide is how they work. Um, so they'll fill out questionnaires, provide it back to you. As I said, um, best to try to do so anonymously to ensure honest feedback. And then the state team should use the feedback as a set of data points to, pr to provide input to their final understanding of the state's strengths and challenges to incorporate ideas into the improvement plan. Which comes next, um, our, Im our improvement plan meeting kit. It's a how-to guide for the post-assessment stakeholder meeting, which we suggest everybody um, pull together after going through, even if it's just uh, you can do this a la carte or all together. And even if you just do the process mapping, it would be really interesting to bring stakeholder groups in so that they can understand the process. The kit includes a checklist, a timeline for planning the meeting, an improvement plan template, and a work plan template. And the next is just a screenshot of the meeting, um, of the meeting kit so that you can just see. It's really easy. The, the only thing that requires a login is the, um, is the grantee interactive questionnaire so that you can save it along the way. The rest of this information you can access without having a login. So the improvement plan meeting. Um, it might seem like an afterthought, but it is truly helpful to bring all of these pieces together and include um, stakeholder <coughs> input and feedback. Um, bringing it together, like bringing the process map, even if you don't go through the entire questionnaire, if it doesn't look like um, you're not using Medicaid or CHIP programs for your work, you don't need to answer them directly, bringing the questions to even go through with some of the stakeholders in this kind of meeting would be extremely helpful. And then based on these findings, the state teams can use the improvement plan template to plot out goals. Um, for what you want to improve upon. And then it does have, um, within the template, there is an opportunity to share um, responsibility and uh, work out a timeline for how all of that's going to come about. And then finally, why should you use the self-assessment toolkit? Well, it's free. It's free to you. The um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation made a significant investment in pulling all of this together. And it certainly did take a long time um, to get to the point where it's at now. And um, our grantee states were extremely helpful in us um, smoothing out the rough edges that they experienced so that we could put this online for other states to use. Um, it does share resources and best practices all in one place that have to do with enrollment and retention in a way that um, I don't think anything else does. And then it provides a, a, a new way for states to look at its policies, procedures, and systems. We believe it is very relevant to health reform implementation. And as Anne said, we are going to revisit this and look at it in a broader scope and see what else we can add in there so that states can really take the tools for health reform implementation. And particularly during this time of fiscal constraints, this evaluation will help pinpoint and guide improvements to increase efficiency. We had a, a lot of feedback from our states saying that knowing what they, um, of all the things they could focus on within enrollment and retention, pinpointing exact things that they could do that would make a difference based on literature and having all of that in one place, it was very easy to share with um, governor's offices, with state legislatures, and it was just easy and palatable for them to, 
to acknowledge and move forward on. And as I mentioned, you could use all the components at once, or you could use um, each piece a la carte as it um, relates to your work. And that's a quick run through. If you have any questions or comments, I welcome them. Let's suggest this. If we move to the next slide, um, which shows the um, whoops, where resources um, and the, the key folks in the um, in the Max and Roll state and the and the web addresses that you that you'll need. Let me um, we'll we'll open for discussion, but we've asked New York um, and Virginia, who are SHAP and Max and Roll states, to kick off the discussion. Um, sorry, sorry to keep you last because you're from Virginia, Steve, but in alphabetical order we'll go to Ann first. And anybody please um, be happy to raise your hand electronically or type in a question. Ann? Thank you, Ann. Um, I wasn't actually directly involved in working on um, the a diagnostic protocol uh, at the time we received it for the maximizing enrollment for kids, but I've certainly taken a look at it and um, in some cases we've used it as a building block for some of the work that we're doing for preparing for our enrollment center. Um, so I think the areas that we found uh, most helpful um, was the process mapping. Um, and I think Maureen called it arduous. Um, I was going to say challenging. Um, I actually did participate in some of this um, in this process and we've built upon that as we've been planning for the enrollment center, um, developing additional process um, maps for uh, various different you know, processes as part of our enrollment and um, preparation. So I think what it's done is really offered us some insights into systems limitations, into you know, workarounds that have been developed by um, district workers, county workers, or state staff, or whatever. Um, you know, when there's something that needs to get done, um, just sort of highlighting those, those areas. Um, and, and getting into the nitty-gritty details, that again, as we're planning for bringing a contractor on to work at the enrollment center. Um, additionally, as we've been going through that work, we've uh, eliminated uh, our face-to-face <coughs> interview requirement, and um, we, we revamped our application uh, to try to address that uh, so that the questions are easier for somebody to interpret as they're trying to complete the application themselves. Um, and we're also kind of thinking about processes and policies uh, that, are, that may need to be revamped um, when we don't have that face-to-face um, that -face interview for an application. So um, sort of all of those things together I think uh, have been helpful. Um, in terms of the other things that we learned from it, I think a lot of, a lot of, it reinforced a lot of what we knew, I guess, and especially in terms of our um, challenges in getting good data uh, on which to make policy recommendations and, and to base policy decisions. So it spurred us uh, to continue to work toward the goal of improving that. And I think as we look forward for um, health reform, and trying to identify areas where we know there are limitations to our existing systems and our ability to get good data. Um, you know, we're certainly taking note of that and as we look forward to the, the new systems that we hope to have to help us with health reform, um, we're trying to make sure that those things get incorporated, um, you know, if, if we're able to, to get new systems. So. Um, I think you also wanted us to comment on some of the changes and updates in our enrollment and retention, if this is the time for me to do that. Sure. Um, we've been working on a couple of exciting tools um, to do a web-based fill and print PDF application so somebody can actually go online and, and type their answers in on our application and then print it out um, at the end. Uh, of that process so they're not filling it out by hand. Um, ideally that will be a little bit easier for uh, eligibility staff to read and um, it's also going to be accompanied by some help text and tool tips kind of, of, of things to help answer some questions that might come up as somebody's working on the application. So um, we're also working on a new screening tool that will be on the web so folks can um, you know, enter their data, try to get some um, basic uh, response as to whether or not they might meet our eligibility requirements. So. 
And we're working on the uh, implementation of our enrollment center. So our, our long-awaited contract was finally approved and made it through our, our uh, contracting process here in New York. And we are working diligently with our contractor to um, get things rolling. And our call center, first call center uh, went live December 1st, and we're now working toward um, bringing up the rest of it in the spring of 2011. So. Great. Sounds like great progress. Um, so let's, and, and I want others if they have questions for, um, for Maureen or, or other things to share to be thinking about them, but let's, um, let's go to Steve from Virginia. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Horan, and uh, I'm with Community Health Solutions here in Virginia. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work on a number of different uh, health reform initiatives here. Uh, some quick big picture background. Um, Virginia has kind of a distinctive setup. Our Medicaid enrollment is done through the Department of Social Services. Our equivalent of S-CHIP enrollment is done through a central processing unit through a separate agency, the Department of Medical Assistance Services, which actually runs the Medicaid program. So as you can guess, that creates some complexity when you talk about enrollment and retention data. And the second thing I would say is about four years ago, we started a multi-stakeholder group called the Children's Health Insurance Program Advisory Council. Um, and one of Maureen's slides resonated with me about the importance of having multiple stakeholders around the table. At the start of that group, we asked a lot of questions about enrollment, retention, and quality that the departments had difficulty answering because they didn't have the data. The Max Enroll Grant was a major, major catalyst for Virginia. And in particular, Virginia went through the full diagnostic assessment in 2009, and that really helped us leapfrog to a next level. Because going through the process mapping and just working through those questions with multiple stakeholders not only provided us with some answers and potential solutions, but also with some energy. And, and it became a catalyst where a bunch of people said, hey, we've got to get better at this and move forward. So um, I, the, the Department of Medical Assistance Services uh, honchos the Max and Roll Grant, and Rebecca Mendoza and Leah Walker are the key people there. And Rebecca couldn't be with us today, but, but I did a debriefing with them. Um, and she wanted me to relay a few of the accomplishments from Max and Roll. One is, uh, this is very important for us, uh, we now have a contract in place to create a data warehouse that will contain information from DSS system and DMASS system so that we can look at patterns and trends in enrollment and retention across programs with the child at the center instead of the program at the center. This has been huge for us in terms of identifying statewide and then regional and then age-specific enrollment trends and retention trends and really pinpointing problems and going after the policy and outreach and education solutions to, to identify those to, to address those problems, and, and we've actually seen enrollment and retention get better as a result of that, and a lot of that couldn't have really been done well without that data system. So that was, that was really good. The second thing is the questions gave us a framework to go out and hold focus groups with eligibility workers across the state, learning about barriers to enrollment and retention from the worker's perspective, looking at how workers see their roles and responsibilities, that cultural piece, determining how they learn about policies and how they implement those policies and their preferred communication methods, um, and also finding out what the workers hear from consumers about the enrollment and renewal process. And from a cultural standpoint, it's an interesting thing when you actually start to see the client or the beneficiary as a partner in enrollment rather than someone who just gets enrolled. And I think that cultural shift was very, very important in Virginia. Um, We've got a few pilots going that kind of float out of Max and Roll. Uh, one is we're currently piloting a school-based outreach project in Virginia Beach, and that's targeting eligible uninsured teens from their perspective. Um, we're actually working with marketing teachers in the schools to conduct fo teen focus groups and implement peer-to-peer -peer, uh, promotion of enrollment within the schools uh, with an eye towards capturing what works and spreading that across the state. Um, another pilot is over in Rockingham County in the western rural part of the state. They've got the highest number of eligible uninsured children. The, the max and roll questions have given us kind of a framework to go out and develop this pilot 
where we're trying to develop a countywide coalition to strategize ways to identify and help enroll eligible uninsured children. And if you kind of ask the questions at the local level, they're just as helpful. You just have to tweak the questions a little bit. But you get, you get to the heart of the matter very quickly. It's an accelerated process um, when you use those questions in the self-assessment tool. As we look forward, uh, Virginia has a Health Reform Advisory Council that the governor put together, and, and I happen to be on that, and we've got a Medicaid task force. We're talking a lot about how we're going to reach out, educate, and enroll the four to 500,000 adults that we expect to flow into Medicaid from Virginia uh, by, by 2014 and beyond. But, and we're really looking at the infrastructure we developed through Max Enroll and all of its community partners as an asset that we can bank on going into health reform. And I would say the self-assessment tool has a lot of potential just for thinking about outreach and education and enrollment processing for all of the different um, subpopulations that we need to worry about as, as 2014 approaches. It's just a really good diagnostic tool that stakeholders can rally around, and it's understandable and it allows all the different stakeholders, even if they're not experts at this, it allows them to see the light. Everybody likes efficiency. <laughs> no matter where they stand on the health reform bill, everybody likes efficiency, and they want to know that the people who are eligible are being reached and that that eligibility processing is as seamless as possible. So we see this as a good thing sort of in and of itself, you know, for our Medicaid and ESTRA program, but we also see it you know, at least in concept, is a great asset that we can use over and over again as we look at health reform in 2014 and beyond. Thanks so much for those comments, Steve. I have uh, one question for you, and then I, I really would, um, would like to see if others have questions for Maureen or questions of your um, state colleagues who have, at least their state, has gone through this process. My question for you is, um, I know you're, you're thinking about a, a, a slew of things as you are on the um, Health Reform Implementation Task Force. Are you thinking about um, how some of this information might apply to um, the exchange or the exchange um, Medicaid interactions? Yes, and I don't want to get too far ahead because on December 14th we have a big meeting where, where the staff report is going to be released. But I can tell you, in the meetings, you know, we're, 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 what we're realizing is if you've built an infrastructure for outreach and enrollment around Medicaid and SCHIP, you, you, it really just begs the question. You have to try to leverage into that, you know, for this next phase. And obviously, you know, you need to do that in the context of the exchange. Great. Um, so now we have a chance you can you, – I, I see no electronic hands, and I, at the moment, I see no uh, electronic questions. Um, you actually, if your lines are all unmuted, somebody can, in fact, speak up. But um, if you raise your electronic hand, I can call on you. Do we have any questions? There's a lot of material, and it's a, a nice um, personal preview. Um, and that's one of the things we're, we're delighted to have colleagues working on. Um, programs that are relevant because we get first dibs uh, in terms of bringing these resources to you as, as SAP states as well. I see um, one question um, for Maureen, which I think is a great one. How many hours did states typically dedicate to completing the assessment? Do you have information on that? Uh, I'll just say I know that well, I don't know how many hours. It took a really, really long time. Um, and the different pieces, so process mapping alone, I mean, we suggested that states set aside um, to sort of kick it off and get started, like an afternoon or a morning, like a, like a four-hour block, just to sort of dig in and really get down to the nitty-gritty details. And um, I think most states did try to do that. I mean, finding like four hours is incredibly difficult, we realize. Um, but after they did that, after they had that initial um, time together and really dug into things, I think it's easier to go through and then do um, the um, questions on the self-assessment questionnaire. And as I said, I mean, so there will be different pieces for different people. Um, we were also told that um, having one person sort of coordinating all the work around this 
um, is incredibly beneficial, and I think that's what most of our states did. But so as far as ours, I'm not really sure, um, but I, I know that it, it, it took a while. But I will also say this, that there's no timeline. You don't have to complete and finish it within a certain period of time. Um, our, as I mentioned, our states have redone their process maps as, as they have made changes because um, they felt that that was an important thing to keep up to date. And then the, um, the self-assessment um, questionnaire, you can go back afterwards as things happen and, and change different things um, as it pertains to the changes you've made. So I, I guess I would say it's, it's a big job. We're not trying to say that it isn't, but um, if you include a team and coordinate from one point, um, it's definitely doable. Well, Kathy asks, um, whether um, the states, to your knowledge, Maureen, and I guess Ann and, uh, and Steve can, can, can keep you honest on this, have released the results of the assessment publicly, and if so, what, what's been the reaction? Well, we released the reports uh. publicly. So, yes, they're public. Um, and I will say, the states that we have participating in the Maximizing Enrollment Program have already done a lot of work ahead of time. I mean, I, I, we've got Massachusetts, we have Virginia, we have New York, all of these states that have made um, enrollment a, a goal of theirs long before Max Enroll even came about. So I think um, it depends. I, I think other states may have um, different takes on this. Um, and I welcome New York and Virginia to chime in if there has been anything um, that has come up from this. But we worked with them as we released the reports. We said, you know, talk to us. There are um, identified areas for improvements. Um, I believe we called them opportunities for improvement. And I think most people acknowledge because a lot of people were involved in this um, and their, their um, voices were heard and considered. I think um, there wasn't any surprises. Everybody was very clear on everything. And so, and everybody was on board to make changes happen. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big splash. Great. So um, one of the things that I will tell everybody is that we will, in addition to finding it in the links here, we'll post a link on, um, to the diagnostic assessment tool on our shapaccess.org enrollment page uh, following this. If we have um, um, no further questions, um, at this point, while we did, we do have a question in about whether it includes any links to health insurance exchanges, um, and, and my guess is going to be no, but that might be a phase, something that you think about in the future phase. Is that right, Maureen? That's right. And so this meeting that we're um, having with our grantee states that starts tomorrow, um, we're going to start looking at their improvement plans that they did last year based on this assessment and. I mean, a lot has changed <laughs> since we've done that, and so there are new priorities, and we're going to take a look and, and make sure that we're still on target. And so as we, as we go through this sort of next phase of broadening our scope, um, I think we're going to be leaning on our eight states a lot to revamp this toolkit and find out what else we should be including in that. And so we will um, be working to modify it so that we can include information on exchanges and what questions you should be asking. And e I imagine even before we necessarily have answers, just to have the questions out there. But it, it's something on our radar. Well, thank you. Um, I think that, that this is a good place for me to make a few um, organizational concluding comments. Appreciate very much um, Maureen's presentation and for, for Steve taking the time to um, uh, check in with his colleagues and as well as to give us an update on, on some, uh, a big date in Virginia and, and stay tuned for the results of that and Anne for um, you also sharing your experience um, with New York. Um, let, let me note that um, that you will be able to, con you can certainly continue this conversation um, on our SHAP listserv after the call, and we already heard of some things that are going to go out when we were going around doing our updates um, at the beginning of it. We'll also post an archive of this call on um, shapaccess.org and on the HRSA's Healthy Communities site. Um, let me let you know that um, we're going to be migrating our listserv and our um, our, our peer learning call 
function to the um, HRSA uh, Healthy Communities um, platform, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. We're also, uh, as soon as we get that set up, but it is the in intention to do that uh, for the next time we have a peer learning call. We're going to be adjusting the format of these calls uh, for 2011. We're going to host one call for all states each month beginning in February. And the way we're going to do the topics is not necessarily along the lines of the four groups that we had in the first year, but they're going to be, um, we're going to select a topic developed from some incoming technical assistance requests or other areas of interest raised by you, um, our grantees. So we're going to announce, we're going to put calendar the dates ahead of time, and that's going to happen soon. And then we're going to actually announce the topic itself several weeks in advance of each call. Um, I, I know for those of you that want to get multiple participants or perhaps some of your key stakeholders to participate, it's difficult to schedule them within a couple of weeks, but you will have them on your calendar, and we're trying to be as nimble as possible to be responsive to things that um, more than one of you want to discuss. Um, I, I want to reiterate, we do expect at least one person from each team to participate, and really do hope that you can add other teammates or partners as, as appropriate. We're trying to uh, make this a little bit more fluid and to respond more nimbly to issues as they arise, and we will really welcome your suggestions for topics to discuss on these calls. Um, we hope that you've marked your calendars for the next all-grantee meeting. You got registration from Fred today about that, and um, there is a, um, there's a link both to the registration for the meeting and to making your hotel reservations at the Georgetown University um, Conference Center. It's going to be January 13, um, 12th and 13th, and um, there's a group code, State Health Access, that, um, that you're going to need to get the uh, government rate there. So um, let me, as always, point out some other resources. There is the shapaccess.org, and there is uh, the State Reform. Um, dot org that Nashby is um, that Nashby is is doing with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. You will find um, on StateReform.org a number of uh, resources. They are all state developed only, uh, and and you guys I think know by now that we have ten priority areas. Um, actually, eleven priority areas. Eleven is the overall strategy. And we organize the resources according to those priority areas, but also um, we have uh, by types of resources. So there is one on uh, state developed eligibility and enrollment resources. And soon, this um, some of you are on a listserv for this site saying what's new, but soon there will be the opportunity for anyone who would like to sign up for that. Um, it's a technology thing. It's coming very soon, and we will be letting you know to make sure that you can tap into that resource as well. Um, I, I need to report to you that um, Sonia Schwartz is uh, not able to participate as